Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, Yannick uh, Hefrey, uh, who will speak today in our seminar, SID Seminar of Mathematical Physics. Yannick uh, did his PhD in ENS de Lyon uh, in 2017. And uh, since then, he was uh, uh, so active in. Uh, field of classical quantum gravity, conformal differential uh, geometry, uh, asymptotic symmetries. And uh, uh, so it's my pleasure to give the floor to Yannick. Uh, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Simon. OK, so um, yes, OK, thank you for the invitation. So since I see participants, I see Kirill is there. I should say that I also did my PhD in Nottingham. So OK. So Okay, um, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, you can say more if, uh, if you want. Sorry, maybe I... No, no. <laughs> uh, so, yes. So, and yeah, I was saying, as I was saying to Iman, I think it's a good idea to try to have this discussion between math and physics. And uh, this is something that I really sympathize with. I've been trying to do this in the last years. Um, and uh, so I try to have this um, seminar in this direction. And so, uh, yeah, this is been based on ideas that I've been developing in the last couple of years. And this is about um, general relativity, so gravitation, um, and geometry, asymptotics in general relativity, which are uh, which is a very classical subject. Um, um, but you'll see that I try to have a, um, a perspective on it, which is deeply rooted in some tools um, that um, have been developed in the last 10 years and, and see how they interact. And I think that you'll get a nice picture from this. Um, okay, so the idea is that, of course, we know that uh, general relativity is a theory of geometry. Um, field equations are given by Einstein's equation, but um, PDE's equations are not just about uh, field equations, they're also about uh, boundary conditions. And in this sense, asymptotics are important because they give you a notion of um, you know, boundary conditions at Infinity. So the question that I want to discuss, which is a very classical subject, subject in general relativity, is uh, what is going on uh, at the asymptotics of your geometry, and what can you say, and how can you constrain? Well, are natural ways of constraining asymptotics of uh, general relativity. Um, so, why should you care about this? So, I think considering the audience, perhaps I don't need to motivate this too much, but I'm going to do it anyway. So. Uh, so one classical reason why uh, um, asymptotics, these asymptotic boundary conditions are useful is um, if whenever you want to model isolated system in gravity, um, isolated system that is something very natural from the point of view of physics, you always start in one way or another to define what is your physical system, um, you know, in, in you want to isolate it from the rest. You, you describe the, the physics of a subsystem, and then you want to, uh, then you can ask how does it interact with the rest. But of course, NGR is complicated because um, what you uh, want to isolate is uh, the geometry itself. So the dynamics is uh, the geometry, and typically you want to use uh, the, ge the geometry to make sense of the boundary itself. So there is some sort of tension because this is something specific of gravity. Uh, geometry is at the same time the thing that you want uh, to measure, the type of, you want to measure fluxes of geometry, um, and at the same time uh, the thing that allows you to make sense of the boundary. This is here, I'm not, uh, you know, not making, uh, inventing anything new. This is, uh, this was already advertised a long time ago in uh, Giroch's uh, um, review on this uh, asymptotic in general. So that's very important if you want to make sense of, uh, of isolated system. So the idea uh, that, um, that progressively uh, came up over the years is that the correct way of making sense of these boundaries is to, um, in, in gravity, is to send, to, to send the boundary at infinity. Send the boundary at infinity, there you can, um, I'll tell you how, you can make sense, uh, you can input asymptotics, um, 
condition at infinity, and there uh, the, the geometry is not dynamical anymore. And you get uh, a way of separating what, which part of the geometry is uh, is the boundary itself, is the asymptotics, and which part of it is dynamical and encodes uh, um, radiation, dynamical part of the geometry at the, uh, of the asymptotic geometry. So when you do this, uh, you're going to impose that in some sense, your boundary, your geometry is flat asymptotically. In doing so, you can again uh, split what is boundary part of, of the geometry and what is dynamical, and you can make sense of energy, momentum, um, angular momentum of your system. So you get something which is as close as you could uh, hope um, for uh, an isolated uh, system. Um, okay, so what's the essential idea? Um, so here I try to, so it's not going to be a very precise definition. There will be um, more precise definition um, later on. But this is like very generic idea and how do you deal with this problem typically? And this sort of covers the different type of definition that I care about in this talk. So the idea, um, which is going back to Penrose, um, is to introduce a manifold with boundary. Now you really have a boundary, it's at finite distance, it's there, it's this blue line here. You have a boundary, you introduce a boundary defining function when at the boundary is zero and in the inside it's not zero. So whatever, so what you're doing is that you're effectively adding boundary at infinity. So you, you have, so whenever it's non zero, it's going to be your physical space time and at, you're adding something on top of it. So yeah, this is this requirement. So what you want is that in, in the inside, so anywhere your boundary defining function is non-zero, you're going to get a metric, and this metric should be your physical space time. And but by doing so, you're introduced, you're, you're adding this boundary at infinity, you're adding something. Um, and then the requirement that the boundary is at infinity should be something that uh, saying that your metric uh, is, is not finite, that the boundary it blows up in a particular way, in the precise way you want, you know, the precise um, blow up condition, precise form of the pole as you reach omega, omega equals zero should be is going to depend on the exact type of uh, completion that you're, that you're looking for. So this is like a very general feature of what um, you can, you, type of definition you have in the literature, but really the exact nature, and the exact definition that you care about um, the way of you know choosing this full of but even more more subtle things uh, depends on the direction that you take. Um, so and what does it mean? Well, there are different ways of going to infinity. If you follow fluxes of energy, fluxes, gravitational wave, these type of things, they they follow light like geodesics, and therefore um, you will if you're trying to if you follow this light like geodesics, but you will construct natural type of boundary that you will construct is are uh, null boundaries, boundaries at null infinities. Uh, on the end, uh, yeah, and if you do this, if you do this, um, you uh, will end up with you know, constructing a notion of boundary at null infinity. On the other end, if you follow space like geodesics, so you follow lines that are going in space directions, uh, you will end up constructing another type of, of uh, asymptotics, which are known as space time, um, space, like space like or time like uh, infinity. I'm mainly going to be concerned with space like. The time like is, is really similar um, in spirit. Yeah, and so then, and typically, if you've, you said, I mean, yeah, you've certainly seen this type of diagram before. Um, so here, this, it is, this is a kind of formal diagram from Minkowski. So if you follow a light like geodesics, you end up at null infinity. This is this boundary here that has been attached. But um, and here in this diagram, um, spatial infinity and time like infinity, they have been contracted, they have been contracted into points. So from this perspective, um, they, are, they are singular, but as I showed you before, there are other, other notions of asymptotics that would do the other way around, but like would um, give you a nice boundary at special and time-like infinity, and, and this why would be shrinked. Okay, so this is, um, yeah. so this, uh, this was a bit uh, yeah, the overall picture. So let's get into more precise definition to really see what's going on. Um, so asymptotic flatness at null infinity, so it's whenever you're going in the null directions. Um, so here is the definition. So as I told you, you start with a uh, space time with boundary. Um, you have a boundary defining function. So when omega is zero, you're at the boundary. Uh, and in the interior, well, you have your physical metric and it blows up as one over omega squared. So here the idea is that again, G is well-defined everywhere. Um, it's uh, it's um, up to the boundary, but G tilde is not, it's only defined in the interior. So this is where on this metric, uh, this is, so in some sense, this is a boundary condition. 
uh, some, uh, some boundary condition at uh, null infinity, but then you impose any field equation that you like. So I'm going to be uh, con con considering Einstein's equation, meaning no coupling with uh, matter, but you could, uh, you could ask that this metric is asymptotically Einstein. So with energy momentum tensor with a certain fall off as you reach the boundary. Um, the last piece that you need to constrain uh, in your in your um, in your asymptotics in your initial data at infinity is um, is the cosmological constant because as this as this place I impose that the metric is Einstein the, the scalar curvature could be positive negative or or null but there is something that you need to choose and um, uh, from the asymptotics perspective this free data is in the choice of the norm the sign of the normal. So this is the normal at the boundary. You go to omega equals zero is the is the boundary. Here it's this is the gradient. So you have this this normal is the gradient uh, along the boundary, and um, and yeah, and you can choose the sign of the normal. This is the only invariant, so it could be plus minus or zero. Uh, plus minus uh, plus or minus would give you asymptotically ADS or asymptotically the sitter uh, space times, but uh, in this. Um, Talk, I really care about asymptotic flatness. So I'm really, really going to restrict to the case where n squared uh, equals zero. Um, okay, so what you do then uh, is that, so this is like uh, Penrose geometrization of, of what is asymptotic flatness. In practice, what you do is that, well, I mean, you don't need to do this, but a lot of people do, is that you choose a nice coordinate system in the neighborhood of Scry and you do some formal expansion to the boundary. So omega equals zero is the boundary, and then you you you, you expand. So this would be zero order. This is first order, and then you have a second order pieces. By the way, I should say that sometimes my mic have some have some problems. So if you feel that the sound is wrong, just tell me. And, I, and typically, what I do is that I get out and come back to the to the discussion, and it uh, it solves the problem. If you if there is a trouble, actually, uh, there is uh, some cutting in the voice. Yes. Yeah, that's okay. I'm sorry about that. I'll try to, to come back. Okay, is, th is this better? Typically, it's improved the situation. Okay, it seems uh, okay now. Yes. <laughs> Can you talk about this? Okay. Yes, okay. Um, so, yeah, don't tell me if there is any trouble with this. Um, okay. Okay, so, yes, again, um, practically what um, you you do is that you work in local uh, coordinate systems. So, you can, uh, this, this nice geometrical uh, coordinate free definition. Is one to one with a very practical uh, expansion of the field in terms of the boundary um, defining function. You do your expansion, and what you find uh, so what's the, the main two pieces that I'm going to concentrate on are the zero of order and the first order piece. So, at the first, at zero of order, this guy, uh, you get something uh, which you know, it's constant. Once you rescale the metric, you get something which is constant. So, this is going to be the piece of the geometry which is induced at the boundary. You can just restrict this metric at the boundary. Uh, so you get a metric at the boundary. Um, it's in fact it's a conformal boundary, but it's it's slightly subtle because this boundary is null, so the normal is zero. But so and then so this type of things are either um, obvious or, or unusual if you've never seen it. So the, if the boundary is null, it means that the normal is normal to itself. The tangent vector to the boundary are defined to be the vector which are normal to the normal. So what this means if the normal is null it means that the normal is part of the manifold itself. So the normal here is inside the boundary. Uh, so what you get, um, and, and, and then the induced matrix is not invertible. An induced matrix is degenerate. And so you see here, I chose as coordinates omega is my radial coordinate. So omega equals zero is the boundary. And u and x yeah, coordinates along the boundary. So x is two dimensional, u is one. So we have a three dimensional boundary. And uh, the normal is inside the boundary, it's du. And uh, the metric is some two-dimensional metric on the x directions. So there is this strange degenerate null geometry at the boundary. Sometimes in some part of the literature, it's called uh, Carolian geometry. I'm not going to use this here. 
Um, okay, and this and this this is uh, so Ashtekar called it the universal boundary geometry in the sense that this is the geometry which is not dynamical. This is this is fixed by your boundary condition. This is some geometry which is always there and fixed uh, at um, at the infinite boundary. Now, at second, or at first order, there is some term here which is C, uh, and it's it's a free parameter. So this object is not constrained by Einstein's equation. So, you, so at subleading orders, you, you would impose field equation, Einstein's field equation, and the field would be constrained. Uh, but this one is completely free. Uh, or I mean, it's so. And what is this? Is your choice of initial data. So if you are if you are past null infinity, your this is your initial radiation that you that you put at. Uh, past non infinity is going to evolve into your nonlinear space times. Uh, or if you if you if you're in the future, this guy is the residual uh, gravitational waves which are going to um, you know to, to leak away in the future. Uh, and this guy encodes dynamical part of the geometry. This is really encoding gravitational radiation, so either going into or leaking away um, uh, your space time. Um, okay, this is what yeah again this is this is. This is classical result from uh, BMS. Um, okay, let me now come to the other alternative uh, notion of asymptotics, which is at Ashley infinity. So, and this is this is due to in this form that I'm going to present. This is due to Ashley Romano 1991. Um, and you see, so you are asymptotically flat here, meaning at Ashley infinity. If um, again there exists another space time with boundary m and q. Uh, this is similar. You have boundary defining functions. There is boundary at finite distance you obtain for omega equals zero. Um, but now uh, the form of the physical matrix is different. So before we had only a term like this. Now there is a one over omega squared, omega to the fourth uh, uh, term here. So, so, so the definition is, 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 is very different. And again, you impose Einstein's equation here, and that's all there is. There is no extra condition about uh, the, the, the the sign of the normal or something like that. Um, so again, yeah, what I want to emphasize here is that it's at the same time it's very close in spirit because you're really attaching a boundary in the same way, but the details are, are quite different. Here. And, and, and the behavior of the normal, the behavior of I mean, the details of the, of the geometry is is, 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 is is radically different. So there is this idea of attaching a boundary, but uh, the, the, the way you organize the computation, the, the induced geometry is is, um, is something else. Um, so again, there is a way of making sense of this in some local coordinate system. This is due to Bide and Schmidt. Uh, and, um, so xi now, 0, 1, 2 are going to be my um, boundary coordinates. You do this expansion. I try to organize it in a way that looks like the asymptotically flat case at null infinity. But it's different because there are these diverging pieces now. So the leading order pieces is again something that you can interpret as being some universal boundary geometry. It's the geometry which is induced at the space like infinity and which is not going to be dynamical. What is this guy? Uh, now you get a genuine nice metric on the boundary. It's, it's a genuine metric in the sense that it's, uh, it's three-dimensional, it's invertible, and it's not conformal. So it's really, and what this is, uh, is really, uh, but Einstein's equation are going to impose that this metric has constant curvature. And this has to be, so here I'm rethinking spatial infinity, this metric would be the metric on the sitter three, so three-dimensional uh, the sitter space. Um, and the normal is a genuine normal pointing outward of your manifold, so not something uh, inside. Um, right, and then you look again at first order, and you get something which is dynamical, uh, which encodes the asymptotic dynamics of gravity there. There is this function sigma, uh, which is, Called the mass aspect, and in, for example, in Schwarzschild, this would be something. Um, this would be a function of the mass of your of your Schwarzschild spacetime. And then uh, you have something which doesn't, doesn't really have a nice, uh, you know, standard name in the in the literature, but sometimes called the potential gravitational potential. So that's that's what I will call it. So it's some sort of matrix has the same structure indices uh, on the boundary. And these guys, so it's more subtle here. They are not completely free data. Part of them are free, but now the, the, the boundary is, is time-like. Uh, so the, the, the Einstein's constraint equation here, they will impose some, some PDEs on these guys, some constraint equation at uh, the C to three. Um, okay, so um, yeah, is there 
any question on this uh, at this stage because this I'm trying to organize review stuff which are a bit general. No? Okay, great. Then, okay, let me go on. So, why then? Uh, okay, yeah, so again, why do you care again about this type of asymptotics? Um, this, they model, so asymptotic flat space times, they model, they model uh, isolated systems, so in the sense that you can associate to them energy, momentum, etc. Uh, they are really realizing an invariant, nonlinear notion of gravitational waves. And they are, they, are, they are not virtuous. They are, you have a large class of space times which are these types. So it's a nice uh, key concept in general relativity. Also, surprisingly, or not, depends a bit on your um, piece of mind. It's also a useful notion in quantum field theory. So why is that? Um, and it's, it's, it's really because this space time, they give you a natural geometrical um, realization of the interaction picture of quantum field theory. So you have this idea in, in QFT that you are um, preparing states which are free back in the future and back and in the and in uh, back in the, in the future in the past, and that you're going to use interaction picture to turn on interaction in the bulk and use perturbation theory and, and you use perturbation theory to make sense of the interaction. Um, so 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 this in, this boundary at infinity, they really are the place where you can um, you know, these three states at infinity, they are, you can really make sense of them as being states at this boundary. And they are different. Um, it's, it's correct in, in, this is not just we're, we're talking, it's correct in different way. Um, one way. One way to see that it's, uh, you know, this, this is a useful perspective was this uh, realization by Strominger that you can think of something which is historically understood as being purely quantum, which are Weinberg soft theorems of PFT. You can actually, realize them as being quantum realization of something which is purely classical, which is classical feature of this asymptotic space time. These are BMS symmetries. I didn't discuss this because that's not the main focus of this talk, but these uh, asymptotic boundaries, they have a um, natural set of symmetries acting on them, which is strictly bigger than Poincaré, which is infinite dimensional. Uh, and, and from this perspective, you see it's quite natural to believe that these asymptotic symmetries, they are going to act on the space of three states, which are at infinity. So you're preparing your, st your states on these asymptotic boundaries, and uh, these asymptotic symmetries are going to stack on your space of three states. And, and what uh, Strominger realizes is that you can push this idea very um, far, and, that, and, and the quantum realization of these BMS symmetries on, the free, on this set of states uh, becomes Weinberg soft theorem in the, in, the, in the quantum field theory regime. So it's a fruitful idea, trying to think like this. Uh, so you might wonder, okay, but it's all about non infinity. So why, why should we care about space like infinity then in this game? Space like infinity still is important uh, because it turns out that in order for this result to work out, you need some very subtle uh, matching condition at space like infinity. Um, so there is something about the asymptotics that you need to require there, which is crucial. Um, and this, yeah, this has been the work, you know, the details of what you need to require at space like infinity um, has been worked out in, in several uh, more, most recent work. Um, so, so it's still important, even if you're thinking that you only care about non infinity because it's just a scattering, because you're interested in scattering, it's still important to wonder to which extent is your quantum field uh, scattering theory, what is it requiring of the type of asymptotics that you are imposing at space like infinity? For example, yeah, it's still not clear to which extent this is very natural to, to require this condition from the classical uh, phase space perspective. Um, okay, so this was motivations. Um, so hopefully with all of this, I, I, I uh, motivated, I, should, I, I convinced you that uh, there is into interest into this notion of uh, space like and null asymptotics. What I really want to show you today is that even though um, in the detailed geometry, the two definitions, null and spatial infinity, they are, they are quite different. There is a sense in which they can be unified into one uh, picture, uh, thanks to um, a geometrical framework called curved orbit decomposition of Cartan geometry, which is due to chap gover Amel. I'm not going to use the theorems in, in their full generality, but, but they are more like a unifying picture for, for, for concrete results. I'm going to discuss uh, to show that this idea it unifies the two notions um, 
and should the idea of autonomy reduction as I would say. So this is based on, on work of mine. And in the case of spatial infinity, a lot has already been done, even though it's never it's never understood as being uh, asymptotic of infinity. Uh, there, Again, some connection problem, I guess. Mm. But I'm gonna, uh, you, we can't uh, hear you. That's uh, me too. Oh. <laughs> I said that uh, two minutes. Okay. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> what yeah, at, uh, you disconnected for uh, yeah. one minute, okay. maybe. Mm. Mm. Okay, so let me, okay, I'm not trying. Let me, can you see my screen? Yes. By the way, the mic is still, is still going okay? Okay, uh, the mic actually, for all the time, uh, there is some cutting, but uh, we can understand. Um, okay, most of the things, so. <laughs> yeah, I need to improve on this thing before. Me. Um, Okay. So the last uh, thing you said is about uh, the, the line about uh, unifies uh, between the two notions and uh, yeah. yes. So okay. So this, this this would be one big point that I, that I want to um, try to make today. The other point would be that what you get from this perspective also is you get a geometrical intrinsic realization of gravitational radiation as seen from the boundary. So. Um, Again, gravitational radiations is something that makes sense for your asymptotic flat space time. So you might ask, this is already an idea that, that was asked by Ash Descartes, to which extent can you think of this gravitational radiation degrees of freedom as being some pieces of geometry which is intrinsic to your boundary? And it turns out that it's not that easy to make sense of this. Um, and hopefully I'll try to convince you that what um, this is doing uh, is improving on uh, Ash Descartes classical uh, picture. Um, right. So let's let's start. So if there isn't any question on this. Okay. So um, so as I, I try to convince you, there is a useful notion of um of a curved orbit decomposition of quantum geometry. Uh, but before going into this, it's much, um, it's, it's really useful to consider uh, model, the model case for all this structure. And model case are going to be given by homogeneous cases. So you should be thinking of all that I'm going to discuss now for the next uh, minutes as being the flat homogeneous case, the models for the type of asymptotics that we want to um, care about uh, later on. Um, so yes, so we want to. So this is going. These are going to be homogeneous models. So um, I think everybody should be happy with homogeneous spaces. So these are space times. I mean, they are manifold that uh, make precise the idea that all points look the same. So what you want to require is that there is a transitive action of body group on your um, space M, and then um, follows from general result that then your 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 manifold is just can be identified with this coset where H is the stabilizer of the point. And then it's clear that G acts here just by a multiplication of magnets. So classical examples of homogeneous spaces are the two sphere, and then SO3 is the isometries of the two sphere, but also Minkowski space. And then um, we can we, we take Poincaré as being a group of isometries. Good, so a bit examples which are slightly uh, less and down is uh, this one. So it's an homogeneous space. It's conformally compactified Minkowski space. It's an homogeneous space for the conformal group now. Um, so, so this is so, so it's compact. It's a compact uh, object. It's S one times S three. It's a conformal uh, manifold, and it's um, it's called conformally compactified Minkowski space. And it's an homogeneous space for S O two four, which is the conformal group in four dimension. 
And then, so why is it conformally compactified Minkowski says? Because then you can realize model that you like, like AGS or Minkowski, by choosing an isometry subgroup inside the conformal group. And by doing this, you're going to restrict yourself to AGS or to Minkowski, which are just classical uh, cosets. Um, so let's see how it works in practice. Um, so again, you start with this manifold, which is where, on which you have an action of SO24. What you need to do is choose, you make a choice, you make a choice of isometry subgroup in there. Uh, there are many such subgroups, so it's a choice. And by doing this, you're, you're, now you can, you know, because it's, there is an action of the conformal group on your conformal compactification. Now your isometry subgroup also has a natural action in here. And you're going to decompose your homogeneous species into different orbits, into different pieces. Uh, on each of these orbits, by definition, you get a transitive action. And so each of these orbits itself is an homogeneous species, but now for a smaller group, this isometry subgroup. One of the orbits is the obvious one, the one you're expecting. It's ADS4. This is this one. But there is another orbit, uh, which is also probably expected uh, if you're used to this kind of thing, is it's the boundary of ADS4, and it's the boundary as seen inside this manifold. So this manifold is compact. And you're decomposing it into two pieces. One piece is ADS4, the other piece is the boundary. And uh, yeah, what well, do you have this classical thing that on the one hand, SO23 is, is at the same time realized as being isometry of ADS, and at the same time, they are, it's a conformal transformation of the boundary, and it's realized by the fact that the, the, the quotient is different. Good. Something slightly less standard, but still true, is that you can choose now Poincaré as sitting inside the conformal group, and you get another orbit decomposition. Um, and now you get three orbits instead of two. Uh, one of the orbits is, again, the obvious one, so Poincaré, uh, Minkowski space. Uh, so it's four-dimensional orbit. You get one very degenerate orbit, which is just a point, which is this time-like space-like infinity, infinity point. And you get another orbit, which is three-dimensional, which is the boundary of Minkowski as seen inside this conformal compactification. Um, and again, uh, here, Poincaré acts as isometry on Minkowski, but it acts as some sort of conformal transformation on uh, your three-dimensional boundary. But remember that the boundary here is, is, does not really as a metric. It has a degenerate metric. So you should think of Poincaré as being some sort of conformal transformation for a degenerate metric uh, on the three-dimensional boundary. So you can call it, if you want, conformal Carolian geometry. Uh, this is the type of thing that you like. Um, so yeah, it's conformal, but it's conformal for degenerate uh, geometry. OK, so what's the sum summary here? The summary here is here is that this is a model version of our flat boundary at null infinity. You take the conformal, conformally compactified uh, Minkowski space time. Crucially, you make a choice. You make a choice of isometry subgroup as inside your conformal group. And by doing this, you're, um, you're decomposing your manifold into pieces. Uh, you, the manifold you started from is compact. And therefore, this guy is naturally boundary of this space time as understood as a submanifold of. Uh, your compact manifold. Good. And this is because you, you're, you're choosing, you're thinking of ISO 13 as being inside the conformal group. What it gives you is a conformal compactification because, as you see, there is a conformal geometry in here uh, coming from the fact that the conformal group is acting. Good. Okay. Now you can do it. Uh, you can also this, do these kind of things but with another group, uh, which is the projective group. So instead of starting with uh, Conformal compactified Minkowski space, you start with projectively compactified Minkowski space, which is the four dimensional projective group, projective space time, RP4, which is naturally uh, homogeneous spaces for SL5. Uh, SL5 is a projective group in four dimensions. Then again, you can realize Minkowski space by choosing ISO 13 inside now SL5. In doing, do, in doing so, uh, you get another different type of orbit decomposition. So again, now you choose ISO 13 as a subgroup of SL5. You act on RP4 and it decomposes your manifold into pieces. Uh, and you get different orbits. One of the orbits is, again, the obvious one, Minkowski space. Now, this, uh, this Minkowski space is embedded into a different uh, compact manifold. It's not embedded into S1 times S3, so conformal um, model. It's embedded into RP4, so it's embedded into projective um, Space, space, and 
the boundary that you get are not different. The boundary that you get, uh, so they, so all these three, you get three orbits, which are just decomposing the orbit into three different pieces. This piece is um, the boundary of space time. This is in the time duration. So this is a model for time like infinity. This is a model for space like infinity. And this is this two sphere is something um, a bit, uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a degenerate version of the infinity. Here, null infinity has been, uh, has been has degenerated into just one sphere. Okay, so again, but the statement here is that um, this is a model for an homogeneous model for boundary at spatial infinity. So you start from RP4, you make a choice of isometry subgroup inside the projective group. Because now it's projective group, this is going to be projective compactification. In doing so, you're decomposing your RP4 into pieces and you get natural, this is compact. So you get a natural boundary, which is compactifying Minkowski as inside, inside RP4. Okay, so um, this is the homogeneous space. Oh, yeah. uh, do I have a summary? I don't know. Um, so this is the homogeneous space realization of these models. And now we want to look at curved uh, equivalent of this. So before I do this, is there any question or any problem with the mic, which is so romantic? Okay. Um, okay. So this is these are models, but it's very good to have to have the, they are flat, um, no gravitational waves or nothing here. They are good because they they give you intuitions. Um, or what is going to happen in the current situation. So this is where, yeah, this is where you should think of this as being flat models or curved situation, which is what I'm going to discuss. Um, okay, so, so the idea, so if you want, so there are two pieces here, you need to curve homogeneous spaces and having curved homogeneous spaces is given by Cartan geometry. And then the second piece that you need a curved version of this orbit decomposition, and this would be, uh, this curved orbit decomposition, and I will come back on this later on. But let me take a bit some time to remind you what is a Cartan geometry. Um, so what this is something which is uh, giving you a curved version of this again of this G mod H homogeneous spaces. Um, the, the, what what are the pieces of data that you need to construct this? Let me be brief on this, but still there are two essential uh, things that I want to highlight. Like, you need two things. First thing is you need H principal bundle. So you have this, uh, you quotient by H. So um, there is a, the fact that you quotient by H is realized by the fact in the, in the curved uh, Cartan geometry model. In the Cartan geometry, it's realized by the fact that you want an H principal bundle. Uh, and then the presence of G is uh, realized by the fact that you want a G valued uh, Cartan connection. So G is the Lie algebra of BG. Here, Cartan connection. Um, so so what this is going to be, so these two points, they are really the same as your usual principal um, um, connection. Uh, you see, the essential difference is the fact that you, you, you are, instead of, you have an H principal bundle, but the one form of your connection is valued in G. So this is the crucial difference. And this is some sort of non-degeneracy condition um, relating the two. The model that, should, that you should have in mind is that, uh, so if you care about G mod H, so this is the model, this principal bundle is given by the, the obvious projection. G is your, the total space of the principal bundle, you quotient by H, it's of the fiber is, is H, so this is your H principal bundle for the model. The uh, Cartan connection itself is just obtained by taking the Maurer Cartan form. So you take this um, omega G, which is there, and this is your Cartan connection. And of course, it's an isomorphism, it's re just realizing this fact that Tangent space to G is isomorphic to the Lie algebra of G. Okay. So what makes this definition really useful is not only it's, uh, it's, it's giving you a curved version of your homogeneous spaces, but you have a notion of flatness. So what you so there is this fundamental theorem of Cartan that you can there is a notion of curvature of this geometry. And when it's zero, well, by this theorem, what this means is that your geometry, in fact, locally is just isomorphic to your model. So there is so, so curvature is the obstruction to your Cartan geometry to be genuinely curved, not to be in fact some local version of your model. Okay, so this was uh, this in here we are just making uh, G mod H curve. But what is of interest is trying to make 
to obtain a curved version of this orbit decomposition. So how do you translate this idea that you're decomposing orbits? Uh, well, what you need to remind you yourself is that the key thing, the key choice that you're making here is a choice of subgroup. You need to choose, there are many, you need to choose one isometry subgroup inside a conformal subgroup to, to, to obtain this orbit decomposition. Um, so um, the curved equivalent of this is um, going to be polynomial reduction. So here's the game you're playing. You start with a Cartan geometry model on your conformal geometry. Generically, uh, it's, it's the Lie algebra is valued in the conformal group. So uh, polynomies are x value in the conformal group. Um, now you're going to impose a field equation. This is where really you're having field equation. You're, you're going to impose that the holonomy of your connection are in fact uh, just one guy. And, and in doing so, you're imposing that your connection is choosing for you a particular isometry subgroup inside the conformal group. So it might seem, uh, I mean, depending on your mindset, is, it might sound a bit uh, um, esoteric, but it's very practical things to do. Uh, you have your connection, and what doing so is imposing that there are certain tensor fields which are parallelly transported. So there is here some R6 object, which is tractor field or local twister, depending on, on who you are you asked to. Uh, it's supposed to be I squared. Uh, you, in, and it's, if, it, if it's parallel transported, then it's realizing this uh, autonomy reduction, uh, which are going to be your field equation. So what do you get from this? So again, this is the curved version of choosing an isometry subgroup inside your um, conformal group. And this is going to realize the curved version of orbit decomposition. So what do you get? Um, so first of all, what are the fields that you can read off into in, inside of this geometry. So it turns out that the Cartan geometry together with this field R6, when you look in the in details, what are the three fields in there? You get a metric and a function omega. And they are, in fact, there is some uh, gauge transformation acting on this field in such a way that uh, they are not unique. They are up to risk gaining. So it's really a conformal metric. And then at any point, so it's a very classical result in tractor geometry that at any point where omega is non zero, well, you can construct this matrix, which is the ratio of um, omega and g. This is conformal invariant, and this is Einstein. So, and, and again, this is this the fact that this is Einstein is coming from the fact that you're imposing field equations. Polynomial reduction is a field equation in your tractor geometry. The way it's going to translate in the fields is the fact that the metric you're constructing in this way is Einstein. But you get more than this. You also get that uh, at points where omega equals zero, you, get, you have a boundary, and this boundary is automatically uh, um, a boundary for an asymptotically flat space time. Um, and it's, um, yeah, so, so this has been done for non zero cosmological constants by uh, Rod Gover some years ago, and I worked out the details in the uh, lambda equals zero case. Um, so I think I really emphasize that this is quite fascinating because you start with something that looks as being just field equation, you're imposing autonomy reduction. But not only, what's fascinating I feel is that on the one hand, you do Einstein's equation, which is just saying that this autonomy reduction, uh, Einstein's equation that is imposing on your metric, you know, autonomy reduction is Einstein's equation whenever omega is not zero. But at the same time, this autonomy reduction also knows about specific asymptotics. It's also imposing some very particular type of boundary condition on your metric. It's imposing that it's asymptotically flat. So it's so one prescription, autonomy reduction, is at the same time taking, taking care of field equation in the bulk and at the same time some specific asymptotics. And the deep reason why it's doing so is that it's it's make, it's, it's making it's realizing in the curved setting this orbit decomposition of uh, homogeneous spaces. Uh, Hi, Yannick. Is it possible to ask yes. a question? Yeah, uh, what selects the value of the cosmological constant here? Very good. This, so this is the isometry symbol. So one thing you could do is look, for, if you were looking for autonomy reduction to S root to 3, you would get ADS. Or, um, yeah, we get ADS. So it's, practice, that, it's that tensor in practice that you choose. Absolutely. So this, this is this, this condition here. Ah, uh, it's OK. It's so the type of the tensor. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So if you, so, so if, so I squared, the rule is that I, the sign of I squared is minus the lambda, minus the cosmological point. That's very, yeah. Indeed. But so, and so the point is that, um, 
yeah, as I will sh sh show now, uh, later on, um, what's going to be very different is, so, is the type of geometry which is induced at the boundary. Um, and, and, you know, so and I squared equals zero is going to be very different. I'll come back on this. But, but at this stage, what I want to insist on is the fact that you can do exactly the same, but now with this other model of projective geometry. Uh, so again, start with a Cartan geometry model known RP4. So you have an SL5 valued uh, connection. So it's valued in the, in the projective group. Now you impose a field equation that again, autonomy is reduced to the same group, um, point A. Um, and in doing so, Again, it's something very concrete. You impose that certain turns of fields are parallelly transported. Here, it's a five times five metric, which is degenerate, which is give, going to give you either one, three inside SL5. Imposing this uh, autonomy reduction is going to um, how you feel the equation. And what is this? So local fields are again a metric, again a function, but you also have a connection. And print what's going to happen is that in general, this connection is not compatible. Uh, with the metric. So you have some equivalence classes and only one of these objects in these equivalence classes is compatible. This is going to be the Einstein metric that you that I'll tell you, which is here. Um, and, and, but here I, I wanted to write this in, write this because it's projective geometry. So you should expect that there is some sort of projective invariance in the edges. Um, this connection is, but you obtain naturally is not a connection, is a projective class of connection because you're working with projective geometry. So again, what's fascinating here again, is that again, by imposing a polynomial reduction, this one on uh, your Cartan geometry, you get any times when omega is not zero, you get an Einstein metric. Uh, and this uh, is uh, in, in, in chap Gover. But if you look, what is going on at points where omega equals zero, you get a boundary, but you also get, what you get is a boundary which is asymptotically flat, especially in infinity, so it's asymptotically flat in Ashtika Romano sense. And again, I think it's quite fascinating that one uh, thing, one field equation, autonomy redu reduction at the very same time gives you Einstein's equation, but also there is a particular type of asymptotics related to, which is make realizing third version of this orbit decomposition uh, in the homogeneous spaces. Okay, so yeah, here is the- Another, another, another very simple question. Uh, how does Poincaré sit inside SL5? It's site, okay. Um, so you take SL5, you have a few, so you need to stabilize a line. So, okay, you see here, you need to stabilize a line. Um, so you see it's, you have a block four by four, which is SO31 uh, on, on, on the lower, and then you have a line of R4 on top of it. So it's really very natural. Um, yeah. So that's why you need to preserve a line and a metric. Um, okay. So yeah, here's the, uh, the summary of this, which uh, I, think is, I think is a very nice unifying picture. Um, so of course, uh, it's very well known that you can understand there is this Magdalene Montsouri uh, formulation that realizes Einstein's metric as, as from coming from ISO 1 3 connections. But here, the idea is that you can get Einstein metric with specific asymptotics by starting from connection with value in the conformal group and then reducing, reducing to ISO 1 3 or starting from projective group and reducing to ISO 1 3. In both cases, you're producing Einstein metric, which are asymptotically flat. It's just the particular type of, um, of, uh, of, of connection that you're choosing selects either conformal compactification and therefore boundary at null infinity or projective compactification and therefore boundary at spatial infinity. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So at this stage, I should give a word of caution. So, this is very nice. I want to emphasize really that details of the boundary geometry is very different, but the overall, um, it's, they, are, they are really unified in this sense. So in this sense, they are really the same construction. Uh, but, uh, so, so it's really unifying. There is something which is um, a bit subtle that you have to keep in mind, is that in a lot of physical, so all I, that I said is correct. You have to keep in mind that in a lot of physical application, uh, 
uh, it's very natural. I mean, you, you need to allow for lack of differentiability along the boundary. So, um, so, so, so in, in many situations, you will need to ask that along the boundary, your Cartan geometry is not C infinity. There will be some lack of uh, differentiability. It's going to be very important to incorporate interesting feature of your space time. So in this sense, you know, this is this part, which is not as much natural as uh, my seems from uh, the, 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 you know, the way I'm, I'm telling this story. But still, uh, it's, uh, it's nice. Okay, so at null infinity, the, the lack of differentiability really is coming, going back to work of Krista de Lucan, which, uh, which uh, constructed a lot of examples where you, do, you, you are missing differentiability at null infinity. At special infinity, it's even worse because, in fact, the presence of mass already is forcing you to have a lack of differentiability. So the projective geometry is going to not to be C infinity for sure. But anytime you have nice, interesting solution at special infinity. But uh, okay, that's life. Uh, but then, uh, the, uh, I think that there, that there are some nice results that are not that are still there to be um, investigating, trying to understand what is this geometry of, of spatial infinity and how does it interact with this projective geometry. So this is ongoing work. Um, and, and again, here lack of differentiability is going to be very crucial. You have to be very very careful about what you're doing, otherwise you are excluding a lot of solutions. Um, okay, so so this yeah, this I wanted this is with this I conclude on um, on um, on uh, this uh, unifying picture. I want so unless there are questions, I want to 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 finish on another thing that you can obtain from this perspective. Uh, okay, so one first thing is that again, I, as I told you, this tab cover armor theorem it's a very general theorem, telling you that this, this what I, this type of story I told you about which is that you have something happening in the homogeneous spaces. You have a decomposition of orbits in the homogeneous spaces that uh, after holonomy reduction, it's going to mean that you have some kind of boundary of your geometry. Um, it's, a, it's a generic feature. So this theorem is, is very, very general. You're always going to have this type of boundary. What is nice and specific of this example I discussed is the fact that you have Einstein's equation occurring. Um, they are plus this very specific, nice um, um, model. Probably they are coming from the fact that you're using ISO 13 as well as polynomy reduction. Um, okay, so it's always there, but this theorem tells you that you have more. Um, you have more, it's also telling you that the boundary geometry is automatically going to be a curved version of this boundary homogeneous spaces. So um, you know that boundary geometry, for example, at I mean, of asymptotically flat space time, they have to be curved version of this. So, and, and this is one the thing I want to discuss now. Uh, so again, what's the story here? Uh, the story is that you start with a conformal Cartan geometry model on this. Um, so I really, I really want to emphasize that this is not something new. It's something very classical. Uh, in in four-dimensional, this is called local twister uh, connection. You impose polynomial reduction. So you impose that secretly, in fact, this uh, connection is takes value in ISO 1, in ISO 3, 1. In doing so, uh, you're defining a boundary, as I already uh, discussed. Uh, but you get more. You get that you also know the geometry that is, which is induced. So in, in the bulk on your um, um, Minkowski space time, the, bond, the geometry, the Cartan geometry is just the usual Magdo ML3 in your, on your space time. But the boundary, you get something which is a bit original. Uh, it's a Cartan geometry model on this unusual homogeneous spaces for ISO 3, 1. And this is what I want to um, um, discuss now. So first step is to wonder, okay, what is this? Um, because uh, for sure it has never been studied. So what is this uh, uh, geometry? When you look into the details, what, what is it about? I, I should say that, again, this type of phenomenon follows from general results from uh, Chapgover Hamel, uh, but it's a very general theorem, uh, very abstract. And in, in practice, you need in each of the nice cases that you care about, you need to, to work out what is the precise geometry that, um, uh, that your patch, for example, is producing. This is what I did in this case, uh, in this work. Okay, so uh, first, the first thing you need to do is understand what is a Cartan geometry model on these homogeneous spaces. Again, uh, what you need to understand is first thing, you have an H principal bundle, and then you have a G valued Cartan connection. Okay, so first part of the result, is the following thing is um, you get an, you, this H principal bundle, so valued for this subgroup here, 
uh, is going to be one to one to correspond to the fact that you're choosing this universal structure. Remember, this is the structure coming in the leading order in the VMS expansion. So it's this degenerate geometry at the boundary. Um, choosing this, uh, what Sekar was calling universal structure, is in fact the same as choosing this structure group. So here you have to be careful. Uh, this structure group is not a subgroup of GLM. So it's not like you're taking the bundle of frames on, 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 on your n dimensional manifold and you're doing something by selecting frames on your, um, on your, on your, on your, on the tangent bundle. Really, what this is, is a subgroup. Um, I mean, you need to go to two jets. What you need to do is you go to two jets, you look at the bundle of frames of two jets, and this is a subgroup. This is a reduction of the two jets bundle. Um, so if you want the result is that reduction of two jets to this, uh, two jets principal bundle to, to this subgroup is the same as choosing this um, universal structure. Now, this is the H principal bundle, and you can wonder, okay, well, now what about the Carton connection itself? What about the ISO one and So yeah, this results they are all true in n dimension. So what, uh, what, what about this connection? Now, in most of the examples of Cartan geometry, typically there is a unique uh, normal Cartan connection associated with this uh, uh, principal bundle. Typically it's unique. But in this particular, so for example, if you are doing ADS, the boundary geometry is just a conformal geometry. There is a unique normal Cartan connection. There is nothing interesting lying there. Uh, just conformal geometry, nothing else. Here, um, these geometries are different. If you try to, to constrain Cartan connection compatible with this structure, you will not find a unique one, you will find a full family of them. So there is some freedom in the choice of geometry. Uh, it's really crucially going to depend on the dimension. So let me, for today, let me really just restrain, restrict myself to n equals three, which is the physical case, the boundary is three dimensional. Uh, so again, what's happening is that you do not have a unique Cartan connection. There is a whole moduli. You have, there is some freedom about choosing the data at the boundary. What are these data? This data is exactly the same as this first order data, this asymptotic shear, including the dynamic proof of the geometry. So what is going on is the following thing. So it's really something intrinsic about the, the, the geometry of non-infinity. There is this H principal bundle, which is just this universal boundary geometry. And now the dynamic part of the geometry, gravitational wave, reaching null infinity in four dimensions, they are realized as being a choice, particular choice of uh, Cartan connection, although on this homogeneous spaces uh, at the boundary. Uh, yeah, okay. so this is the picture. You start with uh, an homogeneous, uh, you are in, what this is saying to you is that any time you have an asymptotically flat space time, you get something induced at the boundary, which is this type of Cartan geometry. And what this is, is really, a geometrical realization, uh, completely invariant here, of what gravitational data are just from the point of view of non infinity itself. Something which is completely intrinsic. You can define this geometry without any reference to, um, to Minkowski space. Um, and yes, so I think thing I should stress is that it's really not obvious to realize these type of things. Uh, so, for example, Still in 2018, you could find, you would find the following statement in HTK review on the subject. It will tell you that it's clear, it's quite clear when you work in coordinates, that radiative aspects of the infinity, they are very close to those of a non-Abelian gauge theory. It, it, it smells like it in many respects, but which, you know, where is the connection? What is the gauge theory? This, this, is, this is the gauge, this is the geometric polarization. So, uh, and of course, and, the, and um, but of course, it's, it's very non-standard in the sense that it's a Cartan connection for this homogeneous spaces, um, which is not 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 something classical. Uh, so it's really I want to say it's really uh, geometrizing in a completely invariant form gravitational radiation as seen from the point of view of the point. Okay, now this is what you you can get you can push this idea even further. Uh, um, so. Strictly speaking, the connection what it encodes are gravitational characteristic data. And the presence of radiation per se is, is, is really inherently described by the presence of curvature. You compute the curvature of this connection, something that makes complete sense uh, from, from the Cartan geometry perspective. What you figure out when you're matching this uh, curvature at the boundary with the uh, asymptotic data of your um, Minkowski space is that it's computing some pieces of the bile tensor, so this uh, Newman Penrose coefficient, psi 4, psi 3, imaginary part of psi 2, which are 
uh, essentially a realization of gravitational radiations. So, so this is the message is that in general, initial data at the infinity, they are intrinsically understood as being um, a choice of Cartan connection and, and, and radiation is curvature of this boundary geometry. And you'll get more from this because uh, by Cartan's theorem, curvature, which is now uh, radiation, what is this? Well, by Cartan's theorem, this is the obstruction to having an isomorphism with the model. So in general, this geometry is curved. There is no way of identifying your boundary with these homogeneous spaces, but precisely in the absence of radiation, well, this, this, this uh, curvature is zero, and this is just, you have one isomorphism. Why is it important? Because it, you know, it means that only when in absence of radiation, you can choose a Poincaré group acting on the boundary. When you have radiation, there is no such identification there is no Poincaré group acting at the boundary, which is the re reason why you have, you know, you're going to have this BMS group, which is infinite dimensional, uh, acting as symmetry group. Um, because there is for sure no way of selecting one nice Poincaré group as long as there is uh, radiation. Okay, so I'm almost done. Uh, yeah, I just want to say what else. But at this stage, somehow, um, this is, uh, depending on your mindset, mindsets, you, can, you might have the thing that is just rephrasing of things that people know. I feel it's more. I think it's, uh, it's giving unifying picture and it's offering new ideas. And what type of new ideas can you get? Uh, well, something that we are working on uh, with uh, Noemi, Parini, and uh, Nicolas Boulanger in Newmont is um, um, developing new type of asymptotics, but not for super manifolds. So what's the game here that you're playing? So remember what was crucial was this um, in the conformally compactified case was choosing ISO 1.3 as inside of S424 can do the same thing in the supersymmetric context. So um, the conformal group in two dimension, in four dimensions is SO24, which is also SU22. Super conformal group is SU22N. And you can realize something called super compactified Minkowski space as an homogeneous space for the super conformal group. Um, so you can play the same game. What about orbit decomposition? Now, in fact, it's been essentially not studied at all. So um, we played this game of, um, of uh, doing the orbit decomposition uh, of super, su the super conformal compactification of Minkowski space. You choose a super Poincaré group inside your super conformal group and you do orbit decomposition. You get strange orbits, uh, which we are, st we are still learning, trying to, to learn the geometry from this. One of these, these is clearly a supersymmetric version of SCRI. Uh, and okay, it's a nice exercise, but also it's clear by that by holonomy reduction, by this very general principle, what this gives you is that it defines already a notion of asymptotically flat supermanifold. All you have to do is you start with a, with a SU22N uh, super, connect, so a super connection is valued in this uh, super conformal group. You impose holonomy reduction, it's defining for you a notion of asymptotically flat supermanifold, which as far as I know has been essentially never, is not developed at all. Even though it's clear that it's, it's useful um, in the sense that, um, as I was telling you before, this asymptotic, they realize free states, asymptotic free states in, the, in, in, quantum, in quantum field theory. And surely it's useful to have, uh, okay, so let me say that you can realize the super and BMS group acting here. Uh, and in this, surely it's useful to have a geometrical realization of super BMS group on asymptotic data and to precisely have a precise understanding of the geometry. Okay, so let me, um, so this, okay. this is just the beginning of this project, but I really want to, wanted to show that this perspective is not just a way of rephrasing things that you know, it's also gives you new ideas that you would certainly not get from the usual coordinate perspective. You know, one of the reasons that nobody ever, as far as I know, tried to develop a notion of a synthetic flat supermanifold is that it's very clear which type of coordinate system we need to start. While this tells you uh, the type of geometry that you should be looking for. Okay. Um, right. So this uh, was my. Uh, uh, so these are the. This was my main message. So on the one hand, uh, you have this. I wanted to emphasize this notion of curved orbit decomposition of Cartan geometry, which is unifying uh, in a very keen way two different notions, null and special infinity. Um, and at the same point, it's not only is a unifying perspective, but also it allows you to uh, rephrase in a very clean and intrinsic way 
the, the geometry of null infinity in terms by the you know you have the following results that gravitational waves at the boundary are understood in a full intrinsic way as being a boundary Cartan geometry. And curvature is the is the key feature here. But you have more, uh, it allows you to produce new notion. Uh, it should allow us to produce new notion of asymptotics for super manifold. This is ongoing work. Um, especially interesting here would be uh, cell dual supergravity, which uh, is going to be very interesting uh, thing to look at. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm convinced that there is more to say about spatial infinity, uh, but uh, this is still ongoing work. So, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Yannick, for uh, this talk. Thank you so much. And uh, okay, the subject is uh, a little bit advanced and more uh, than what I can understand, but uh, at least the slides were, were very uh, organized and I, at least uh, I think everyone can follow the main, uh, main points, even if he's not. Uh, uh, specialist, uh, there was some uh, there. There was already some uh, some questions uh, within the talk. I don't know if uh, you have other questions uh, from our guests. Well, I, I yeah, I would like to ask some more questions. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. To, to, uh, to understand, I'm trying to understand why these two groups that you started from, uh, namely conformal and SL5, are relevant for description of metric geometry. So yeah, you want to understand metric geometries which satisfy Einstein equations. What tells you that these two groups are interesting starting point? This is not clear to me. I can see that Poincaré sits in both of them, yes. But so why not take some bigger group where Poincaré sits? What what selects these two particular cases? I don't know. Um, I mean, yeah, it might be that there are other examples again. Which are even which are interesting. Uh, and actually, I think that for, for space like infinity, I'm sort of I'm sort of thinking into those directions. So, so uh, you see, so, it, yeah, it's, it might be that there are bigger groups where which are even more interesting. You get more structure. Uh, seems like this is a very general principle. You consider Cartan geometry, uh, then you consider a subgroup. Of the big group, and you impose holonomy reduction, yeah. and well, you get some interesting statements this way. But I'm trying to understand what, what what's the so so you see from from what I mean. The, one thing is that what's uh, very nice about this construction is that it's, you sort of you can guess a lot of what's going to happen in the curved case by studying the homogeneous space. So what is clearly nice from the very beginning about these uh, models is that you, you have a nice boundary. You're realizing very cleanly uh, Minkowski space as being inside a compact manifold and there is a compact, there is a boundary attached. This is very nice about this model in the very first place. But you could imagine, and, and in this sense, conformal geometry and projective geometry are very classical subjects. So it's, that's, what, that's why they are very obvious thing you want to try because in some sense, it's very well known that. <laughs> that, uh, that um... Well, another way to rephrase my question is why both of them uh, give you Einstein equations? Why both okay. these Cartan connections tell you Einstein? Do you have an well, explanation for this? I, I didn't know. I, I mean, I feel this part, I feel, is more, some, to some extent, is more the mysterious part. So it's clear the principles, as I was saying, the principle tells you that you need, you're going to have a boundary. That's clear. You could have you could have imagined having some other field equation less interesting or that perhaps here what's very surprising is that it's it's producing Einstein's equation and this is not this is this is a bonus of, uh, of this this particular model mm -hmm. and and uh, it's not clear to me how you could guess this just from the homogeneous spaces. Of course, if the homogeneous spaces themselves are not Einstein's, then, <laughs> then, uh, then no. But as a comment, this reminds uh, a lot. Uh, there is a usual story of holonomy reduction in Riemannian mm -hmm. geometry. And it's typical that holonomy reduction implies some statements about curvature. Mm -hmm. And well, uh, in many cases, uh, special holonomy means 
uh, for example, flat, right? So we just yeah. think about you know, hypercalic condition in four dimensions. It implies that Riemann uh, Riemann curvature is Ricci flat. Yes. Uh, and well, in 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 other cases, I don't know, in eight dimensions, spin seven again, it implies mm -hmm. uh, Ricci flatness. So holonomy reduction tells you something about. Uh, yeah. about it tells you Einstein, right? Ricci flatness mm -hmm. is Einstein. So uh, the statements you made uh, in, in this Cartan approach are very similar in spirit. So yes, they are very similar. But I feel perhaps perhaps something that should be emphasized is that so in this example you're talking about, you're really starting with a metric mm -hmm. and um, you're imposing autonomy reduction on, on the Levi-Civita connection. Here, for example, in the projective case, there is no metric at all. You're just really starting. So the, the the initial geometry is projective geometry, so it's just geometry of connections, so it's very weak. And by imposing autonomy reduction, it's, it's producing a metric with very specific field equation. Okay, yeah. So, so, so in this sense, I, I really, you, you, it's true, it's it's very similar, but at the same time, yeah, it, here, what's interesting is that you're not starting with metric uh, mm -hmm. geometry. And again, you could imagine. Uh, for example, I should say, for example, in in, in the in terms in the the, the super conformal geometry that we are studying here, it's really not. It's it's it was surprising to me. So it's really not something like you have an equivalent class of metric on a super manifold. It's not like this. So surprisingly, uh, super conformal geometry is something. It's essentially not geometry of metric on a super manifold. It's, it's geometry of distribution of very of a particular type. It's quite surprising. So. Um, and so I think you you yeah you 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 by looking at some other groups you could have imagined different type of geometries which would I'm not sure whether this is going but yeah it's not like you start with a metric and autonomy reduction constrain the metric it's 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 even more interesting than this you're starting with something else and it's producing metric from it. Mm -hmm. well it's producing again it's not producing it out of, out of nowhere you have these particular tensors. That you are transporting, and these are distances which are producing the metric typically. So, so it's, yeah, it's not coming from anywhere. Mm -hmm. No, but I don't know. I think I think this is to be. But okay, let me tell you my. So it's clear that this guy, this mathematician, Chap and Cover, what they do and they did is that they realize that they have these general theorems, and then they look at examples that they care about. Uh, but in doing so. Um, they do it from their perspective. So they, for example, this is quite fascinating. This paper they wrote on projective compactification. You look at this theorem, and it's clear that what they're producing <laughs> is, is Ashtika Romano definition, but they are not even aware of this. And I asked them uh, a year ago, when it, actually when we were in, uh, in Vienna, I asked Chap, ah, oh, it seems to me that your projective compactification is the same. And he was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so, um, so I think it's a nice example where they have this machinery producing interesting stuff, and it's interesting to see what physics com comes up. I mean, that's my well, I, it's fascinating geometry, it's absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful. So, is there uh, other questions or comments? If not, um, I uh, thank again uh, our speaker, uh, Yannick Hefai, for the nice talk and all the present uh, here. Thank you for coming. And uh, I wish you a good day and uh, see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Have a good right. day. Thanks a lot for, for coming. Have a good day. You're welcome. Yeah.